Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm uh, Tom Hardwick. I'm a research fellow at the uh, University of Melbourne. Um, I started here about a year ago. Um, my background's in psychology, so my PhD is in experimental psychology. And um, actually, you will hear quite a few of the examples of research that I give during the talk are, are based in psychology, um, which may not be your discipline, but hopefully there's some more generalizable um, lessons to be learned from those studies um, as well. Um, but for the past um, uh, several years, I've actually moved somewhat away from psychology into this um, field that is often called meta research or research on research. So I'm largely going to be talking um, uh, about that today. So um, let's get straight into it and start with uh, the good news, which is that um, scientific methods um, are, of course, one of the most effective means that we have for generating useful knowledge um, about the world around us. So you only have to look around you to see scientific success stories like COVID-19 vaccinations or rovers on the surface of Mars. So clearly science is one of our most magnificent inventions and science works. However, just because science works well some of the time doesn't necessarily mean that it works well all of the time or even the majority of the time. And you're probably aware that over the last decade in particular, there's been this growing chorus of voices from across disciplines, um, prominently in medicine and in psychology, um, highlighting that an unacceptably high proportion of research appears to be wasteful, inaccurate, and even potentially uh, misleading. And this has led some to claim that there's a credibility or a reproducibility crisis. So I think a core issue to appreciate here is that it's very easy to slip into the uh, the, the mindset that scientists are somehow more objective or more rational than other people. But really, scientists were, were only human um, and were affected by a range of different um, cognitive biases and motivations for our behaviours that can undermine um, our decision making. So as, as a few examples, um, you probably heard of confirmation bias, which is this tendency to preferentially seek out, evaluate and recall information that supports um, our existing beliefs. Another bias is called apathenia, um, a tendency to identify seemingly meaningful patterns in completely random data. And perhaps one of the most um, uh, frustrating ones is the bias blind spot, which is a lack of awareness about how our own decisions are influenced by our own biases. And although one of the main motivations for our behaviours as scientists is probably to gain useful information about the world around us, our behavior is also being influenced by other motivations that might not necessarily align well with that goal. We all have egos, we have career ambitions, and we have rent to pay. So to make matters worse, scientists are embedded within the scientific ecosystem, which consists of many different structures and stakeholders that currently tend to exacerbate rather than protect against those inherent human biases that we all have. So it's quite well documented that many of these stakeholders, such as journals and funders and universities, often have a preference for aesthetics over authenticity when it comes to scientific findings. And this typically manifests as a preference for novel, positive and clean findings over incremental, negative or messy findings. So when the allocation of funding and awards and publication prestige is predominantly based on research findings being impressive over being right, it's easy to see how this can create a skewed incentive structure that leads to the production of biased research. So what can we do to, uh, to change this situation? Well, scientists have been trying to improve science ever since they invented it. Um, science actually has its roots in alchemy. Um, Isaac Newton was an alchemist. Um, and we might call al al alchemists uh, proto-scientists because they were actually doing some scientific -y type stuff like running experiments, but they also did some stuff that we'd probably think of as quite unscientific. Um, many of them thought that the knowledge they were pursuing, this alchemic knowledge, was so powerful and so important and so often ordained to them by God that other people couldn't be trusted with it. Isaac Newton actually deliberately wrote up some of his experiments and theories in an obscure code that only he knew um, how, to, uh, how to interpret, so that nobody really knew what he was talking about. 
Now, intellectuals like uh, Francis Bacon and Robert Boyle um, started making the case for a different kind of knowledge generation, um, a, a kind of knowledge generation that involved greater transparency, more collaboration, and, uh, and also replication. And that's what led to science moving away from its um, initial roots in alchemy. But many attempts to improve science um, often fail to gain traction. So a classic example of this from my field is that um, psychology studies are typically seriously underpowered even to detect modest effect sizes. And this has been repeatedly demonstrated over the years. Um, as you can see on this graph, each of those orange circles represents a different meta-research study which has shown that there is low statistical power in a particular domain of psychology. And yet there's been no obvious improvement in statistical power over the years, at least up until um, uh, 2015, as shown on this graph. Um, so despite these repeated demonstrations, there's not really been any, um, any uh, active response to them. And as you'll see later in my talk, even those basic ideas about transparency and rigor that were advocated by Bacon and Boyle back in the early days of science um, continue to be um, seriously neglected today. So I think that what this reflects is that there's an enormous amount of inertia in that scientific ecosystem and simply um, pointing out problems isn't necessarily going to lead to um, any tangible improvements. Now, uh, you're probably aware that this recent um, credibility crisis or, or whatever you would like to call it um, has cat catalyzed uh, many new tools and initiatives that are intended to improve science. Um, and this raises a number of important questions. So what effect are these various initiatives and tools actually having? Can we make them more effective? To what extent can they be translated between different contexts, like different types of research or different research disciplines? And do they have any unintended negative side effects um, that might lead us to modify these initiatives or even abandon them? In the last decade or so, alongside this credibility crisis, um, something else quite significant has happened, which I think enables us to try and answer some of these questions and to accelerate our efforts to improve science. We've seen the dramatic growth of a discipline that's often called meta-research, research on research, um, or meta-science, in which we use scientific methodology to study science itself. And to some extent, matter research has been around for a long time. There's a lot of um, obvious crossover with longstanding disciplines like philosophy of science, for example. Um, but there's also something quite special, I think, about the kind of matter research that has emerged recently. Uh, in particular, it's focused on gathering systematic empirical data about science's problems and then trying to actively implement solutions to address those problems. So my colleagues and I tried to um, capture this translational nature of meta research in, in the following framework. In the first stage of the framework, we have researchers engaging in debates about potential problems in science or ideas about what they think science should look like. And that's the part of meta research that I think has actually been going on for centuries. Uh, Boyle and Bacon were arguably um, operating at this stage um, back in the 1600s. In the second stage, Meta research is set out to investigate problems systematically, usually empirically, in order to gauge their prevalence and their severity. And um, as I mentioned before, there have been some examples of this in previous decades, like those studies on statistical power, for example. Um, but there's been a quite dramatic acceleration of this kind of work um, in recent years. Now, this empirical work at the second stage that documents problems has catalyzed a range of different reform initiatives. So at stage three, we have individuals and organizations trying to develop tangible solutions to these problems, um, like those that I showed um, on the previous slide. Now, crucially, at stage four of this framework, meta researchers can do further studies to evaluate whether those solutions are actually working. Um, how effective are they? Is there anything we can do to improve them? Um, uh, are they having any negative side effects that we need to be aware of, et cetera? And then finally, um, at the end of this framework, we have these two arrows between stages three and four, which represent a feedback loop in which we're iteratively refining solutions or even abandoning them um, in response to those empirical evaluations. 
So um, what I'm going to do for the rest of the talk is to illustrate how this framework can unfold in practice, um, drawing um, various examples from my own research. So let's start with um, stage one um, and talk about a potential problem um, that um, various researchers have raised in science. So you're probably um, familiar with this idea that science is or should be um, a self-correcting enterprise. The idea is that over time, the veracity of the scientific literature should gradually increase as falsehoods get refuted and credible claims get preserved. And here are some potentially important components of um, science's self-correction machinery. Um, I think we can roughly categorize these as well in terms of whether they have um, a, a more short-term and direct correction effect, uh, for example, by identifying specific errors in prior work, or they might have a more indirect and long-term effect, uh, for example, by accumulating evidence that steers us away from an erroneous understanding of the world and towards a more accurate understanding of the world. So, um, for example, if we have um, uh, the data from a, a previously published study, we might try to run a reanalysis of that study, um, which may lead to us finding errors in the original analysis pipeline. We may also try different alternative um, forms of analysis to see whether the original findings um, are robust. That's often called a sensitivity analysis or a, a multiverse analysis if you're running um, a large scale factorial version of, of a sensitivity analysis. Peer evaluation, we're all familiar with in the form of um, uh, uh, journal peer review. Um, our peers can, of course, spot um, errors in our work. They can also um, recognize unacknowledged limitations of research or provide alternative explanations that might change people's beliefs about um, the contribution of prior work. And then uh, replication studies, I think, um, lie between short term and long term. Um, it is sometimes the case that in the process of running a replication study, are you trying to repeat the original methods and collect um, some new data? Sometimes you do discover an error in the original study, which can lead to a direct uh, updating of your beliefs about that study. But often the results of replication studies can be ambiguous, or um, even if there is a clear difference between the replication study and the original study, we often don't know what the cause of that difference is. Um, so in that sense, a replication study is just another data point in the landscape of data points on a particular research question. Um, and then we may use tools like systematic reviews and meta-analyses to collate all of those data points and quantitatively synthesize them. And the general idea there would be that the weight of evidence should steer us towards um, a more accu accurate picture of what's going on, um, given that particular research question, even if some individual or a few um, individual studies would lead us to make erroneous conclusions. So um, some academics have argued that one of, one of the major reasons that we have a lot of poor quality research out there um, is that this self-correction machinery isn't functioning correctly. Now, there are many reasons why um, uh, that machinery might not be working well. Um, I'm just going to focus on a key one here, which is that scientists don't often have access to the basic raw ingredients that we need for that machinery to work effectively. So, for example, if you don't have access to the raw data that underlies a particular scientific claim, then you can't run a reanalysis or a sensitivity analysis. And if you don't have the analysis scripts from the original study, it can be hard to spot errors in the original analysis pipeline. If you don't have access to the original study materials like survey instruments um, and detailed protocols about how the study was run, then the peer review process can't be, can't be comprehensive and spot errors in those particular um, items. And it's also very tricky to run high fidelity replication attempts. If studies aren't pre-registered, then the original authors essentially have free reign to selectively report research outcomes. And this can introduce bias, and that ultimately um, can undermine um, our efforts to synthesize literatures with systematic reviews and uh, meta-analyses. So I'll give you um, some concrete examples. Um, here's an example where a lack of transparency um, appears to have thwarted a, um, a self-correction activity. So this is um, some results from the reproducibility project in cancer biology. And the goal was to try and replicate 
193 individual experiments that had been reported in 53 high impact cancer biology papers. Now, ultimately, um, the team were actually only able to repeat 50 experiments from 23 papers. And by repeat here, I mean whether they could even run the experiment. I'm not even referring to the results of the experiments here, just whether they could run the experiment. And a key problem that prevented them from running many of these replication experiments was a lack of basic methodological information in the papers reporting the research that they were trying to replicate. So I've just highlighted a key part of the, um, the graph on the screen there. In all cases, the replicators, um, when they needed clarifications, they got in touch with the original authors. They found that they needed at least one protocol clarification in every single um, replication case. In the majority of cases, they required more than just a few clarifications. That's represented by the yellow, uh, orange, and red colors. And they always got in touch with the original authors and asked, you know, can you fill in the gaps here or what we're missing? Did the authors help them? Uh, unfortunately not. Uh, in the majority of cases, uh, the authors uh, either did not help, that's uh, shown by red, um, or provided only minimal um, assistance, that's shown by yellow. Um, and this and these um, lack of uh, clarifications of the protocol often prevented the research team from uh, running uh, a replication study. So this example, I think, illustrates how a lack of transparency can actively disrupt a potential self-correction activity. So uh, conversely, here's a more positive case where transparency actually facilitated um, an act of self-correction. Um, this paper, Growth in a Time of Debt, uh, is a highly influential economic study. Um, it was often cited by um, leading politicians around the world as justification for austerity measures. Um, and then the other paper on the screen is a critique of growth in a time of debt by uh, Thomas Herndon and colleagues. And Herndon was actually a economic student at the time. And for a class assignment, he was trying to reproduce the original analysis in growth in a time of debt. Um, the original data analysis were not initially available, but he contacted the original authors and they sent him a spreadsheet which contained uh, both the data and the analysis formulas embedded in the spreadsheet. And after looking over um, what was in the spreadsheet carefully, um, Herndon and his colleagues decided to write up this critique. Um, and they argued that the spreadsheet contains um, coding errors, uh, selective exclusion of available data, and unconventional weighting of summary statistics. And ultimately, they conclude that um, these problems seriously undermine the, uh, the claims of, um, of that highly influential paper. Now, I'm not an economist, so I'm not going to weigh into who's right or wrong in this particular case. The point I want to make here is that having access to the original data and the analyses um, enabled this informed scientific debate to take place about the veracity of the, of the original claim. Okay, so that was um, some stuff at stage one. Um, I've laid out a theoretical case of a particular problem affecting science and that a lack of transparency um, might be undermining science's ability to self-correct. Now, at the second stage of the cycle, we can start to think about how we investigate that problem systematically um, and empirically to try and assess its extent and its severity. Um, so I'm going to tell you about um, some work we've been doing um, the, and, uh, and uh, colleagues as well um, from, uh, from Metrics, um, a meta research group at Stanford University. Um, and uh, what I'm going to show you uh, in a moment on the screen is the results of four different studies that all used um, similar methodological approach. The goal was to estimate the prevalence of various research practices related to transparency and reproducibility um, in different scientific domains. Um, I've hidden the results just for the moment so I can orientate you to the slide. So the approach in all of these studies was to take a random sample of articles um, published in the particular domain of interest and then manually check them to see if they had followed these particular um, research practices. So you're going to see two studies from the domain of biomedicine um, shown in the, uh, the lime green and the forest green, um, a study from psychology in the navy blue and um, the social sciences more broadly um, in purple. So uh, feel free to look at 
whatever domain is of, of most interest to you. Um, I'll just uh, uh, pick up some highlights here from the domain of psychology, which is my discipline. Um, so we're estimating that in the field of psychology um, for the sample uh, in, in these particular years, which was 2014 to 2017, we estimate data sharing to be just 2% of papers, sharing of analysis scripts to be just 1% of papers, and the use of pre-registration to be just 3% of papers. Um, some of the other um, uh, transparency indicators perform a bit better, like conflict of interest statements and funding statements and uh, open access, for example, open access to papers. An important caveat here is that um, uh, this study is now a little bit old. Um, the sample we looked at was from 2014 to 2017. Things may well have improved um, since then. Um, it's also potentially true that certain subdomains of these broader domains, like uh, cognitive psychology or social psychology, for example, might exhibit different patterns. Um, or particular journals, perhaps the more prominent journals in these domains, um, are performing better. Um, we don't really have great data on those questions right now. Um, we're currently working on projects that um, enable us to monitor these practices continuously over time um, and also at a much uh, more granular level of detail. Um, so we can see just how much progress we're making towards improving research transparency. But at least um, back when these studies were done, um, the situation was looking um, pretty dire in terms of um, how often uh, researchers were actually um, adopting these um, transparent research practices. Now, um, one objection you may have to the, the findings I just presented is that, well, okay, maybe the authors don't explicitly state in their papers um, that they've adopted these particular practices, um, but maybe if you just uh, wrote them a nice polite email and asked them to send you, for example, the data, uh, wouldn't they just send it to you and, and that would be fine. Um, for years, that has been the standard policy of various um, organizations and journals, um, like in my field, the American Psychological Association is very influential. Um, and their policy has for a long time been that authors should make data available on request. They don't have to share it when they publish the paper, but they do have to share it if you contact them and ask them to share it with you directly. Um, it's now been, I think, fairly convincingly demonstrated that this, um, this approach to data sharing um, of basically assigning the ongoing responsibility for stewardship of scientific data to scientists is a complete failure. Um, so this is a, a non-systematic selection of studies, um, but I think an illustri illustrative selection of meta-research studies that basically all contacted um, uh, authors of papers in particular domains and asked if they would make the data available. So essentially challenging or checking this, um, this requirement that data should be made available on request. In the vast majority of cases, uh, authors did not make uh, data available uh, on request, as you can see from the results there. Um, now, there are, of course, um, important reasons why data sharing is not always straightforward. There can be overriding legal, ethical, um, sometimes practical constraints which complicate data sharing. Um, but typically, those reasons are not stated in published papers. So it's very difficult to judge um, if a lack of sharing is reasonable or not. Um, in the two studies uh, at the bottom of uh, the table, um, uh, my colleagues and I contacted the authors of the most highly cited articles published in psychology and psychiatry on the one study and the social sciences in another study. And we made the case to them of why data sharing was important and that the data from these highly cited studies should be preserved somewhere and available to the wider scientific community. Um, unfortunately, in the vast majority of cases, um, the authors did not agree to make the data available. In fact, the the modal um, outcome of these studies is that nobody from the original author team, when you usually contact multiple people, um, nobody ever responds um, to these um, data sharing requests. Okay, so let's move on to um, the developing solutions um, part of this framework. And uh, there could be many um, different initiatives uh, to talk about here. I gave you a, um, a hint of those in, in a previous slide. Um, but I'm going to focus on um, journal policy. This has been a major focus of 
uh, reform efforts because journals are an important leverage point in the scientific ecosystem um, uh, because they can, to some extent, influence the quality um, and the practices of studies that enter the, um, the academic literature. So you may have heard of um, the transparency and openness promotion guidelines, the top guidelines. This is an initiative that was launched by the Center for Open Science and, uh, and various other researchers to try and get journals and other organizations like funders to embrace policies about uh, practices related to um, transparency and, uh, and reproducibility. So um, they um, developed this, um, this uh, framework you can see on the screen here. These are the top guidelines. Um, uh, on the left-hand column, you can see um, the various um, research practices of interest here, like uh, data transparency, um, pre-registration, replication, et cetera. And then um, in the other columns, um, uh, with increasing stringency from left to right, um, you can see um, different implementations of policy related to those practices. So, for example, if we look at data transparency, um, top level one would require that articles um, published in a particular journal, for example, state whether or not the data is available. Level two would require that the data must be available in a, in a trusted repository um, when the paper is published. Um, unless there is a good reason that they can't be shared, in which case the reasons that they can't be shared must be stated in the manuscript. And then level three requires that there's actually independent verification by the journal or its uh, peer reviewers um, as to whether the shared data can actually be used to reproduce the analyses reported um, in the original paper. So three different levels of increasing stringency for each of these different um, practices related to transparency and reproducibility. So um, a couple of years ago, we looked to see whether psychology journals were actually adhering to these um, top guidelines. So we took a, um, a random sample of um, 40 psychology journals um, so we could estimate the prevalence of these policies across psychology journals in general. And we also looked at the, um, the most prominent psychology journals, um, i.e. those with the highest uh, impact factor, the, uh, the top 50. And uh, these were all journals that published empirical research. Um, on the graph here, you can see the proportion of journals that had policies related to these particular um, research practices with the darker colors indicating stricter policies and an absence of color indicating no policy at all. The blue is showing the random, sa uh, random sample of journals. The red is showing the, um, the high impact um, journals. As you can see, most of the graph is white space. Um, so the overall message here is that the substantial majority of psychology journals didn't have any policies related to these um, particular uh, practices. Um, and it was only marginally more likely to see um, uh, these policies uh, in the more prominent journals. So there's plenty of room uh, for improvement here, just in terms of, of having policies in the first place. But an important question to ask is, of course, whether when journals do adopt um, these policies, are they actually effective? Um, that brings us to stage four of this framework, um, evaluating solutions. So um, I'll give you an example of a study we ran uh, performed at this stage of the framework. Um, there's a psychology journal uh, called Cognition, um, and they actually introduced a mandatory open data policy back in 2015. Um, so this required that uh, before an article was published, the authors had to make the data available in a third party repository like the Open Science Framework, for example, unless there was some reasonable reason why the data could not be shared. Um, so this is a policy that's consistent with um, top level two. Um, and we wanted to assess uh, whether this policy was effective or not. Um, so to do this, we uh, manually extracted information from um, 417 articles that were published, um, submitted, sorry, before the policy was introduced, and 174 articles that were submitted after the policy was introduced. We checked each one to see whether it had a statement saying whether the data was available or not. 
And if the statement said the data is available, we then checked those data files to see whether they met these three uh, criterion of um, reusability. So the first one was accessibility. Could we successfully download and open the data file? The other one was in, uh, completeness. Is raw data provided for all of the variables that were measured in the study? And the third one is um, understandability. So are the data files um, sufficiently uh, documented and labeled such that a independent researcher can understand um, what's happening in the data file? So um, this was an observational study. Um, I've hidden the results uh, of the graph for the moment, just so I can orientate you to the slide. Um, it was an observational study, but we, uh, we performed an interrupted time series analysis, which does give us some scaffolding to make causal, causal claims about the effectiveness of the policy. Um, on the y-axis of the graph here, um, we have the proportion of articles that had a statement saying the data are available. And then on the x-axis, you have the, uh, the submission date of the article and the black arrow points to the, uh, the time at which the, uh, the policy was implemented. So these are the results from the just from the pre-policy period. The red line here is a logistic regression with 95% confidence intervals. As you can see, there's already an increasing trend towards availability before the policy was introduced. So this crystallizes why it was necessary to use an interrupted time series design, um, because our, uh, our desire here is to make causal claims about the effect of the policy, but we have this pre-existing trend uh, uh, to worry about. So the interrupted time series analysis helps us to um, essentially parcel out um, that uh, pre-existing trend to some extent. This dashed line represents the counterfactual of what might have happened if that pre-existing trend had continued. And then this is what actually happened. So we have this marked level change at the time point of the intervention. And that's followed by an accelerated trend towards increased availability um, that um, actually goes above and beyond what we would expect based on that pre-existing trend alone. Um, uh, ultimately, towards the end of that um, uh, assessment period, uh, uh, articles are starting to reach 100% um, compliance um, with the journal policy. Um, but overall, in the pre-policy period, there were 25% of articles saying the data was available. In the post-policy period, it was 78% uh, of articles on average. We're not aware of any other significant causal factor occurring um, at that uh, time point. And so uh, we think that strongly indicates that um, this was a um, this trend that you see here is uh, largely a causal effect um, of the policy. Now, uh, we also checked those um, data sets to see if they were reusable in principle. And unfortunately, in the pre-policy period, only 22% of the data sets that we checked actually met all three of those reusability criterion. Uh, in the post-policy period, this had improved somewhat. Um, so 63% uh, of the, uh, the data sets that were purportedly available um, actually met those reusability criteria. So that means that still over a third of data sets being shared in that post-policy period uh, don't actually appear to be uh, reusable according to our um, assessments. So there's lots of room for improvement there. Now, uh, in the next phase uh, of the study, we um, did some even deeper checks. Um, we looked at um, analytic reproducibility, which is whether repeating the original analysis on the original data gives you the same result as reported in the original paper. So this is very similar to the idea of computational reproducibility, which you may have heard of before. The slight difference is that with computational reproducibility, um, you usually have access to the original analysis scripts, and you're just trying to see whether you can rerun those analysis scripts. Um, in our case, we rarely had access to the original analysis scripts. So what we um, instead tried to do was to re-implement the original analysis as best that we could um, in our code based on the description of the original analysis that was provided in the original paper. And note that we're not trying to collect any new data here or trying alternative analysis specifications. We're literally trying to reproduce the original results using the original data and the original analysis specification. Um, I'd argue that that's a, a minimum uh, quality standard that we should be expecting of um, all articles that uh, deal with um, quantitative data analysis. 
So um, the way that we uh, approached this was to take a, um, a pseudo random sample um, of the articles that had already passed those reusability checks. So this is a very kind of narrow um, uh, subset of the broader population of, of um, potential articles we could have looked at. Um, they've already passed those initial checks. And we went through um, and identified um, what we call a relatively straightforward and substantive finding. So by relatively straightforward, I mean that the, um, the kind of analyses uh, that we tried to reproduce had to be pretty basic stuff that you'd find in an undergraduate level statistics um, or a methodology book. Um, so we're talking basic descriptive statistics, correlations, t-tests, ANOVAs, um, the occasional um, uh, Bayesian t-test, but um, nothing particularly complicated um, or advanced. Um, and we took um, the first substantive finding that we, we came across in each paper. We did this for 35 articles from the cognition study that I've been describing. We also did a very similar study later on um, at the journal Psychological Science, which is one of the flagship journals of, um, of our field. Um, and we had a very similar methodological approach there. So I'm going to show you the results of both studies. So it's 35 articles from cognition, 25 from psychological science. Um, we tried to uh, independently reproduce um, the numbers that supported one substantive finding for each of those articles. And the way that we operationalized reproducibility was to say, if there is a greater than or equal to 10% discrepancy between a value reported in the original study and a value that we obtain in our reanalysis, we consider that to be a major reproducibility error. And if there are any major reproducibility errors in an article, then that article is not fully reproducible. Um, if we encountered any such errors, then we always got in touch with the original authors. We sent them a, um, a detailed report of our reanalysis, and we asked them if they knew why we couldn't um, reproduce the original results. So um, here are the results um, before we contacted any of the original authors. The results are very similar for cognition and psychological science. Um, basically, for um, a third of the articles, we could fully reproduce um, the selection of analyses that we'd um, we'd selected. Um, that means for about two thirds of the articles, um, they contained at least one value that we were unable to uh, to reproduce successfully. Um, recall that we always got in touch with the original authors, and I think except in a couple of cases, the authors did always reply to us, um, and they often provided um, additional information. The information we received from them was, in all except one case, information that wasn't provided in the original paper. So typically the authors were clarifying um, aspects of the analysis that were uh, incomplete, um, ambiguous, or um, sometimes even incorrect as reported in the original paper. Sometimes they were providing um, uh, additional data that was missing, and sometimes they were correcting data which they said was uh, incorrect. Uh, the initial data that they'd shared. Um, in one case, we had missed a footnote in the um, in the original paper, so the the reproducibility problem was um, was was our mistake. So now I'll show you the results from after we contacted um, authors and they provide provided assistance. The reproducibility success rate went up to um, just under uh, two thirds. So there was this um, quite big improvement with author assistance, but as I say. Um, the author assistance was stuff that wasn't actually in the original papers in most cases. And a very important caveat uh, when uh, interpreting these, re these results is that though we've clearly identified a number of, um, I think, quite serious reproducibility errors, um, we didn't see any patterns of errors that clearly undermined the author's original conclusions. So uh, being quite uh, cautious about what I say here. So recall that we only looked at um, uh, a subset of the analyses reported in a particular paper. We didn't try and reproduce every single analysis. Um, so to some extent, we're limited in what we can say about the paper um, at, at large. Um, additionally, um, we would often find a problem with, um, say, one or a few uh, numerical values in the paper, um, whereas other values were reproduced successfully. So it wasn't clear to what extent those errors um, actually undermined the, the overall conclusions of the paper. 
And then sometimes um, there were situations where, uh, for example, we might find um, a smaller effect size than as it was reported in the original study, but it might still be statistically significant and in the hypothesized direction. So in that sense, it's still consistent with the original hypothesis, which was just um, directional. So it's possible that if, um, if someone uh, dug into these papers further and had more domain knowledge, they might uh, make more confident um, claims about the veracity of the original conclusions. But in our case, we focused on just pointing out these um, reproducibility um, issues. Now, uh, the reason that we ran these studies wasn't anything to do with the, the, uh, the individual authors of these papers or even the individual papers. And um, what we wanted to do was to see whether there was a systematic um, reproducibility problem um, with psychology papers. And it seems that there is. Um, fortunately, there are um, plenty of solutions now um, to uh, this problem. There is a whole universe of tools which make it possible to write a fully reproducible scientific paper. Um, I won't say it's a necessarily easy process, uh, particularly if you're not familiar with um, uh, programming languages like R or Python. Um, and I hope that the user friendliness um, of these tools um, starts to improve soon. Um, we do have um, a couple of, we have a paper and a, and a book as well, which have some guidance in them about how to write reproducible papers. If you're interested, um, you can uh, follow, uh, follow those links there if you'd like to get a bit more advice about how to um, uh, write reproducible papers yourself. Um, so now we get to the, uh, the very last part of this framework, which is this um, ideal that we have a feedback loop between solutions developed at stage three and the evaluations. So if we just did these evaluations and they just went into the vast space of the academic literature and everyone ignored them, then that would be um, uh, upsetting. Um, in this case, we did have a, a nice example of a feedback cycle um, because the um, editors at Cognition wrote this response to our study and they highlighted a number of changes that they were gonna make um, to their, um, their journal's data policy. Um, the changes don't actually go quite as far as we would have um, liked. So one of our main um, recommendations was that the journal should require sharing of analysis scripts as well as sharing of data, because having the original analysis script tells you very clearly uh, how the original analysis was run. And one of the main problems we encountered was ambiguous specification of the analysis in the original paper. Um, I think the editors didn't want to go that far because they felt it would be a burden on authors. Um, Nevertheless, this was generally a positive response in the right direction. Um, so um, a nice example of a, of a feedback loop. I have another study here I can tell you about um, just to, um, uh, to, to wrap things up. So um, this is a study um, uh, related to another aspect of self-correction. I mentioned earlier peer evaluation, which usually happens at the, uh, uh, the pre-publication stage during peer review. Um, but I'm particularly interested in um, something I'll call uh, post-publication critique, which is um, whether you can submit a, um, a critique to a journal after um, a paper has been published. Um, and you can point out various errors with a paper or limitations that weren't acknowledged or alternative um, interpretations. Um, and I think this is an extremely valuable part of the self-correction process. And uh, Charles Darwin agrees with me. Uh, he says, uh, to kill an error is as good a service as, and sometimes even better than, the establishing of a new truth um, or fact. So um, what we wanted to do in this study was to see how scientific journals actually handle those um, uh, submissions of um, uh, post-publication critique. So uh, our, we, we have this operational definition of post-publication critique, which is um, a little bit wordy, but it's uh, any journal-based avenue for sharing peer-initiated critical discourse related to a specific research article previously published in the same journal. So a prototypical of that, a prototypical example of that is a letter to the editor, um, but we had to have this kind of tight operational definition. So we knew uh, exactly how to define uh, what we were measuring. Um, our sample was uh, the 15 top ranked journals by impact factor in each of 22 high level scientific disciplines. That's 330 journals in total um, from across the whole uh, breadth of uh, scientific activity. Um, and we, uh, we only included journals that published um, some empirical research. 
Um, our methodological approach was to go to the journal's website and we recorded whether it, first of all, accepted any form of post-publication critique like less to the editor. And if they did, did they impose any limits on post-publication critique, particularly in terms of um, length limits and uh, time to submit limits? So um, as you can see uh, here, you can see the results for these various different domains and the results overall. Um, 207 journals, that's 63% of the journals in the sample, um, offered some um, way of submitting post-publication critique, but this varied substantially across these different um, domains. In clinical medicine, for example, um, all 15 of the journals, 100% of the journals in that domain that we looked at, um, uh, allowed the submission of post-publication critique. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, the field of mathematics, for example, only two um, journals offered some way of submitting um, post-publication critique. Um, as I mentioned, we also checked that when a journal said you can submit, for example, us to the editor, did they impose any limits on the length? Um, some journals, uh, if you look at the uh, the smaller inset graph here, uh, some journals um, stated a specific quantitative um, length limit, and then those quantitative length limits are shown in that um, larger graph, the histogram. Um, some specified a qualitative limit. For example, they said, you know, post-publication critique must be short. Um, or concise, um, but most of them were specifying quantitative limits like 300 words, for example. Um, the most restrictive limit we came across was 175 words. Um, the, the median was 1,000 words, and the interquartile range was 500 to um, 1,200 words. Now, um, from my perspective, I think, uh, you know, I understand journals sometimes have to have some degree of uh, length restriction and they want to promote concise uh, discourse, but particularly at the, uh, the, the the narrow end of the spectrum here, I think one can say very little of substance in 175 words or even a few hundred words. Um, so um, I would say ideally journals should be allowing um, many more words um, for post-publication critiques or perhaps just judging on a case-by-case -case, um, basis um, whether length limits are reasonable or not. The other limit we looked at, I think, was, was even more important, which is the time to submit. Um, so uh, uh, the median here is 12 weeks. So journals are saying you have uh, 12 weeks to submit your post-publication critique after the original article is published, after which we don't accept them anymore. Um, the most restrictive limit we came across was, uh, was two weeks. So you have just two weeks to submit your post-publication critique after the original article was published. Um, in my view, these are completely unwarranted because, of course, a scientific critique can come up at any time. Um, so it seems crazy to impose um, uh, any kind of uh, time to submit them in. And then uh, finally, and I'll, uh, I'll wrap up uh, in a moment, um, we looked at how often journals that accept post-publication critique in principle um, actually publish them in practice. So we randomly selected 10 articles that were published in 2018 in each of those journals. That was 2,066 randomly selected articles overall, and we checked them to see if they were linked to any kind of post-publication critique. Just 39 were, so that's a prevalence estimate of just 1.9% of articles, empirical articles, um, being subjected to uh, some form of critique. Um, we did find that in the majority of cases, the original authors replied to critiques, but in the majority of those cases, um, they did not agree with the critiques and uh, sustained their original uh, conclusions. So um, I'll leave it there. I hope um, that was a useful uh, journey through this kind of translational framework to illustrate how meta research can unfold in practice. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, look forward to hearing your questions. You're also welcome to, to email any questions or feedback to me as well. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. That was a very interesting talk. And actually I had a question about your last slide too. Like, so, you know, so you say that editorials are accepted by, I guess, uh, a lot of medicine journals, like majority of medicine journals, and then a smaller percentage of psychology journals, but uh, do they charge uh, for editorials? Because that would be an impediment, right? To submitting one. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So um, when we when we initially designed the protocol for the study, um, we didn't even know that was a thing that uh, some journals may charge for submission of, uh, of critiques. Um, so we didn't intend to measure it. I think we did encounter 
um, one or two examples um, of that. So my my I suspect it's pretty rare. Um, having said that, we didn't um, try to systematically collect that data, so it's possible there were more examples that we missed. Um, I don't. In your experience, do you think that's quite common that journals require um, payment for a, a post publication critique? Yeah, I I actually can't comment too much, but I know that it it is a thing, and so uh, yeah, I just think that that policy should definitely be <laughs> eliminated. And Tom, like, what's your like? I mean, you've done all this great groundwork. Like, what are you what are you envisioning for your future research? Uh, yeah, good question. So, um, it's it's quite difficult, I think, to to know to what extent meta research and, and particularly my meta research should be to some extent separate from the policy making side. Um, I think if you get into the policy making side, then to some extent you then have a conflict of interest. You can't necessarily be the same person that um, assesses those policies and whether they're working or not. Um, at the same time, there are a pretty small number of people overall, I think, kind of working in this space and, and trying to push for change. So. Um, and, you know, my motivation for doing this kind of work in the first place is to see some kind of change. So I do see opportunities coming up to say work with a journal to, to talk to them directly about what their policy could be or should be on a particular topic. Um, so, uh, yeah, to some extent, the temptation is there to get involved in, in policy work as well. Um, one thing along the lines of the study I've just been talking about, um, I've been interested in thinking about, well, how should a journal actually do this so thinking about you know stage three of the cycle we've pointed out a problem but how should journals actually handle post-publication critique and um i think a good next step might be to, to do a survey of journal editors to get their views on it because to some extent um i'm looking at these policies and thinking this doesn't seem right um, particularly um the time limits but perhaps journals uh, journal editors do have some good reason for those or they have some practical consider so um, in terms of uh, moving down the pipeline and starting to think about concrete policy, I think having, uh, yeah, getting a conversation going with, with journal editors would be a good, uh, a good next step. Great. That sounds awesome. So, um, yeah, I guess, uh, oh, Debbie has a, her hand raised. Do you want to ask a question? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering um, when you talked about short term and sort of those those long term types of aspects of that that you would see in terms of the nature of of how people are responding. I, I guess I was looking at the culture and the lab aspects. Like you kind of don't include anything that's sort of like the pre-publication side from that kind of aspect. Um, like information seeking behavior kind of looks at how people in the labs reach out to each other if they're having questions or problems or those kind of situations. And, and that's more about the culture and how science itself tells itself that, you know, oh, we're so great. We have self-correcting behavior because, you know, but it's down the road. It's over there. It's after we've published and it's not actually when it's, when you're actually in the midst of it. So I just wondering if you, if you were looking or interested in doing things around that. Um, so do you, do you mean uh, kind of correction behaviors within a lab, like quality control? Is that, is that what you're referring to? Yeah. And just the idea about who, who you ask, right? Because if you go in and you ask, you know, different people, um, different, uh, I mean, you're trying to look at a whole range and call it science, and that's hard because it's such discipline specificity, right? So you see a lot of quantitative researchers who are doing theoretical work are not, they don't have a lab. So they may reach out to other researchers when they have any problems or, or questions or trying, or, or even just having that quick, can you review my paper before I send it in? Or, or that kind of interaction, it's more cultural and not prescribed, where after post-publication, I think you see more of the prescribed, you know, you're trying to set up policy, you're trying to say, this is what you should do. I'm just wondering how to bring the whole concept of, of doing really good science all the way back to the beginning of when the science is actually, you know, happening inside a lab, because most people who are lab orientated, I mean, who are they going to ask? They're going to ask their lab mates before they actually, um, if they have a problem, if they're running into a situation or they don't understand the statistics or, or what should they do when, or, you know, when they're writing their paper and they don't include certain aspects that they need to include, it's because they forgot that they did that as opposed to being, you know, malicious and saying, oh, I don't want anyone else to really duplicate this. Does that? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think you're absolutely right that um, there is a, uh, um... And I'd say there is a there is a temptation uh, to think about, you know, well, how can we change this journal policy? Because that seems like the best way to 
um, uh, enact some kind of change. But you're right that um, there are these kind of deeper cultural issues that also yes. need to be resolved. You can't just impose a policy on people if they don't know, for example, um, what it is they're supposed to do. They haven't got the right training. They haven't got the support in their team. Um, or if they don't even believe in the goal, like if they, they think, well, why are you telling me to share my data? I don't even think that's an important thing to do. Um, so I think we do need, um, you know, initiatives in both directions, some degree of top down uh, enforcement, I think is important because it sets a kind of level playing field across um, a field. Uh, if there is general consensus in the field that that policy is a good idea, but you also need bottom up initiatives um, in terms of training, support. Um, there are lots of good initiatives um, springing up in various departments of statistical advisors and open science advisors who will support staff with um, uh, these different activities. And so they are happening at the same uh, time as these top down um, uh, policies as well. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, a lot of it is a cultural problem. Yeah. I was also thinking just if you did an examination looking at um, open access publications and if there's a difference in terms of the reproducibility uh, based on on that kind of framework, like, you know, again, going back to like the cultural aspect of a scientist saying, I'm going to publish, I'm going to make sure that this is open access. Does that have any influence about the quality of the type of work that's happening? But Whether they initially decide to make their paper open access or not? Well, I mean, a lot of researchers are going to start off and they're going to say, you know, we're going to do this research. This is where this is where we're going to shoot for. We're going to shoot for this publication to be here, here and here. So if that's mm -hmm. the case and they end up having an open access publication, is there better reproducibility because they were driven to that? Again, it goes to that cultural feel of, of if this is completely mm -hmm. open, then it's, of course, easier to share my data. And if it's easier to share my data, I'm going to have to worry about it more. Right. Like I have to make sure I have, you know, the text file that explains that data. Otherwise, you know, no one's going to understand it. So then it was useless anyway yes uh yeah I, I suspect that you're right that um you know if, if um if people are um on board with sharing their data then uh, yeah then the, the immediate concern that pops up is well someone might check this and so then you also have to um improve your uh, standards on other practices as well i think that's probably right i don't have any um evidence on that particular question but that's yeah, a good point thank you all right, thank you. So I'm just gonna end, uh, Julie sent us a really nice note. So to you actually, Tom, as a non-professional scientist, but a budding citizen scientist, I found this presentation very useful in terms of knowledge transfer. Thank you so much. Yeah, and thank you so much uh, from us and for speaking at the Method Speaker Series.